Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Johan. Uh, I'd like to talk about WebAssembly today and specifically how you can put WebAssembly in your web app. Uh, in, and I mean kind of real-world WebAssembly in your real-world web app. Uh, although my web is going to be a demo one, but anyway. So uh, I'm a Firefox developer at Mozilla. I work in the security engineering team. I don't really work on WebAssembly, but I, I'm a big enthusiast and I, I follow it closely. Uh, last year, I was here and talked about WebAssembly 2, and I talked about the WebAssembly text format and the WebAssembly binary format and how the two like, are related to each other. And what we did, this is, so this is a lot of code, you don't have to take it all in, but what we did was we looked at the, the like we hand wrote some, cup, some custom WASM code that added two numbers, and you can see it on the left hand side, and then we included it in our uh, JavaScript app with this very boilerplate code here, and it also has some logging in there. So I just went and copy pasted exactly the code that we used back then. And I totally understood when a lot of you came to me, uh, and also during the talk asked, so this is not really ready for production usage, right? <laughs> and it's true, it wasn't. There was, so back then you could, I think it was a point where you could already compile it with a Rust compiler, for example, if you, were, if you wanted to use Rust. Um, which, which also worked kind of okay, so you had to do the same kind of fetchy WebAssembly API boilerplate instantiation, and then you had the same limitations that you had with the WebAssembly text code too. So these limitations are pretty great. If you can only pass in numbers to, like pass back and forth numbers between WebAssembly and JS, and all other communication needs to go through like shared memory buffers, like a big heap, that has just byte arrays in it, or that you can allocate bytes arrays on, byte arrays on it. And that is very inconvenient. And uh, a lot of you said that last time, and I said that last time too. So a year later, we're here, and we have a new cool tool, which is called Wasm Bindgen. It's uh, by my amazing colleagues, uh, colleague, Alex. And um, he wrote this tool to enable the sort of higher level interactions between uh, Wasm and JS that we didn't have previously. Um, and what it does, it automatically generates a sort of JS glue, and it only works in Rust for now, which is why I'm gonna do the demo that I'm gonna do soon in Rust. And this talk is literally gonna be 90% me demoing how this tool works and writing setup for it. So I hope you're, you're in for that. Um, yeah, a couple things you will need, or we will need for this. And when I mean, or when I, you know, in, in the first slide wrote from scratch, I mean, you know, from scratch. We don't, I don't expect you to have, well, a little Rust knowledge would be good, but like, no, you should have a Unix computer. That's kind of all. And um, these are the things you need to install then, and these should work out of the box, and then you're set, right? You can do it on, on your developer machine. You can integrate uh, the stuff into your existing project like this, and there's no extra magic required. Um, if you don't have a Unix machine, if you, if you don't have the time to download all the stuff from, from the conference Wi-Fi, uh, there's a really cool uh, web app which just launched. It's written by my, also by colleagues, Michael and Yuri, and it's, it's amazing. It's called WebAssembly.studio, and it allows you to run all this code, like the JS part and the, and the HTML and the, and, the, and the Rust or C++ or C or just plain Wasm inside uh, a web IDE, and I absolutely recommend you to check it out. It's, it's really amazing, and it gets you started with Wasm quite quickly. It's an online IDE, so I wouldn't, I guess you can't use it for, for real world use, like production usage, but it's really cool to play around with. So now I'm gonna switch to my, uh, my like, terminal to do a live demo. Uh, here are the requirements for us. We're gonna do a small web app that computes the cryptographic hash of a string, like SHA, secure hash algorithm. And I already did the front end in JS, <laughs> and it has an index.html file and an app.js file. It's not, it's not using any complex bundlers or frameworks or whatever, but that's not the point. You could, as you will see, you could still integrate it if you were using complex stuff. The point is that we do the hash computation in WASM, and in, in Rust in this case, because Rust has nice compile time checkers, and because Rust or WASM tends to be faster than JS, so we just want to do it for the sake of it. Let's switch to... Uh, can everyone see this? I'm gonna enlarge. People in the back, if you cannot see the code on the left-hand side, please scream larger or something. Fine, cool, perfect, thank you. Um, so this is our, our setup. We have um, my editors on the left-hand side, my terminal is on the right-hand side, 
And uh, here we have two files in my folder. One's called app.js and one's called index.html. Index.html is, you see, I didn't really spend a lot of time on the front end. Uh, <laughs> Index.html is very simple. It has an input field, it has a button, and it has a script tag. And when you go to the script, we have, we're getting the input, we uh, have the button we're, which we're getting, and then on click on the button, we alert the value of the input, but there's a to-do, can we please hash this? Which is what we're gonna do now using Rust. So how do we start off? If you wanna start off creating any Rust project, and we will have to create a small Rust library for this, uh, you use Cargo. Cargo is the build tool for Rust. Um, and this is pretty cool. You can basically use Cargo to create a new Rust project, but if you want to use uh, the, you know, the Rust code in your project, in your own big app or whatever, you could create the, the library basically wherever you like, in whichever directory you like, uh, because in the end, the, obviously it generates some WASM uh, output, and then you could just use your whatever setup you have, your gulp file, your make files, your um, webpack or whatever, to move it to the right position. So I'm just going to create a new folder called um, Hasher, which is a library in the, just the base directory of my app. So, right. Then um, I go into it, Hasher, and you can see on my editor on the right hand side here, we have a new directory, uh, which is called Hasher, and which has uh, two files. One's called lib.rs and one's called cargo.toml. Now, this is a pretty standard setup for a Rust project. Um, this is some boilerplate that the Rust code always adds. We can delete this in this case. So we start from a fresh, empty Rust library, and this is a boilerplate uh, cargo file. Cargo files are like package.json for Rust, just that it's TOML, it's not JSON. Um, and here's where we're gonna have to add a bit of boilerplate, because Rust was not initially made to work with WASM, so we have to do a very few things to tell the compiler, hey, you know, we're actually working with WASM here. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, yeah, this is what you should do to, to just copy paste it in. So first thing is we tell the compiler, hey, this is a special type of lib. It's not really important what that is at this point. Um, and the second one is that we define a dependency on the wasm bindgen project, which we, uh, yeah, which I introduced earlier. So, um, sorry for doing all the rust. We'll, we'll soon stop doing rust. Um, and then the second thing, uh, second kind of boilerplate I need to put in my Rust file is this allowing experimental features for the Rust compiler, which is also, it's also, it's gonna go away at some point and it's also not super important to know why we're doing this, but just, yeah, this is allowing experimental features. Okay, let's start off. The first thing we have to do in our Rust code is we have to define an extern crate, um, which is called wasm bindgen. That means, hey, you know, we have this dependency, please link it uh, against our source. And then, yeah, right, we have to include um, some of the, import some of the sources in uh, prelude. This basically imports a bunch of stuff from Wasm Bindgen. And now we can get started just writing a Rust function. Like, this is gonna be a very simple Rust function. I hope you can understand it. So it's um, basically saying, hey, we want this bind, bound, basically imported to JavaScript, and then uh, we make a public function hash. And hash takes an input, which is a string, this thing is statically typed, uh, input, I think right like this, it's a string, and it puts a string out. Yes, these two strings look different. One's str and the other's string. That is a very long topic. Uh, in short, one is a pointer to a string or a reference to a string, the other is an owned piece of memory. If you want to learn more about this, please talk to me afterwards. Um, it, it's not really important for, for getting the core concept. And then what we're going to do is we're not going to hash it right now, we're just going to return a, a, a formatted thing where we do hashed and then our input. Okay, this is annoying here. Um, so we're just going to say, hey, I have this template string, please format it for me to include input where currently these curly brackets are. I hope that's understandable. Right, so we define the function hash, returns a string, takes a string, returns a string, take, formats the input to include hashed in parentheses around it. 
That's a pretty simple function. Uh, we're going to do the actual hashing later because I, I don't know how to, how to write a SHA-2 algorithm. Uh, so I'm just going to pull in the library. Uh, how do we build this now? So we use cargo again. You can use cargo build, and then you have to specify a different target, which is RASM32, unknown, unknown. I know, it's, it's sort of confusing. Uh, unknown, unknown means these fields are normally populated for information for the Rust compiler, but for WASM, WASM is just WASM. There are no like, extra platforms or whatever, so we just don't fill them in. Now it's going to build. Oh, and I'm relying on the conference network to work. Uh, create name friend target list. Oh, I made a typo here. Unknown uncone. Nice. Now it works. Now it's compiling all the dependencies of wasn't bind gen. It shouldn't take too long, so I'm just going to block on it here right now um, and give us all the time to breathe, breathe and uh, uh, take in all the new stuff. And this is gener going to generate some files now. Um, that I'm going to show you in a second. Cool, it's done. This is going to not always take that long because it caches the intermediate compilation results, of course, and so you can just do it again and then it finishes really quickly. Let's take a look at what was generated. So we refresh our tree again, and there we can see here a target folder was generated. And in there we have another folder or a couple of folders, and this one's the most important one, WASM32 unknown and known, and then there's another one called debug in there. And here we have the file that we're actually interested in. That's kind of like the only thing in here that we're really interested in. That's the raw WASM file. We can use WASM dump, which is another cool utility to like take a look at the file. Debug hasher dot WASM. Oh, right. And so for what we could do, for example, is we could disassemble it and then we see all the instructions in WebAssembly text format. That's of course a lot of stuff. And um, then we, we can also look at headers. I mean, if, if anyone of you remembers the WebAssembly text format, you know, you have certain headers for certain sections. And so there's a bit of memory and a lot of functions and um, a lot of code too. So what we could do now is we could do the same thing that I already mentioned in my other talk is, um, here it is. So we could just, fetch it and include it here. Yeah, this one. We could just fetch it and include it and use WebAssembly to instantiate and then kind of provide our own runtime for it, which is kind of boilerplate-y and it's kind of boring. So how does Wasm Bindgen help here? Well, what Wasm Bindgen does is we run it again on our Wasm file. And what it will do now, it will generate two additional files. Target, Wasm32, unknown, unknown, debug, hasher.wasm. And we can specify an out directory, which is, of course, convenient. I'm going to put it in the top-level directory of the, of the actual web app, because that's the sources that we're going to use to run WebAssembly. And let's do that. Cool. It's done. Let's see what it generated. So now we have two new files. One's called, it's very, at, you know, at the bottom. One's called hasher.js. The other's called uh, hasherbg.wasm. And I think hasher.js is a really interesting file, so I want to take a look at it with you. Um, what it does is it imports this kind of WASM file, um, which is defined at the bottom, and then it defines a lot of fun utility functions. And one really interesting utility function is, for example, pass string to WASM, and there it shows that like, it takes all this annoying boilerplate -y stuff away from us by doing some of the work that we would otherwise have to do manually. For example, here you pass it a string, arg is a string in this case, it encodes that string into a, um, into a byte array, into a buffer, and then what it does is it allocates memory on this kind of shared heap that the WebAssembly module uses and fills that memory with, this, with these um, you know, unsigned uh, integer with eight bits, so bytes, and what it returns is a pointer, which is just an index, basically, like just an array index of the location of this new string and the length of the string. So that's just a convenience function that the module internally uses, but it's super nice because this is the thing that you would ha otherwise have had to do if you were using Wasm yourself uh, without using Wasm by Gen, um, in order to pass strings. So there's a bunch of more stuff uh, here, um, which is also just utility functions in order to use get uh, what, what's called uh, pass string to wasm. 
And then there's get string from Vosm, which is the same thing in reverse. And then there's a function called hash, which, as you would have guessed, it's not a coincidence. Um, hash is there because we wrote a function hash. If we wrote a function hash too, it will also be in there. And there are a couple of interesting things here. Let's first take a look inside. Uh, we do the whole pointer thing where we pass a string to Wasm and then get a pointer and length back. Um, and then we set an argument and then we call the hash function here. And then we get the return value, like the real return value, which is the string, which is then again read out of the JavaScript uh, byte array. And then uh, we, you know, yeah, free it and return the real return value. Uh, to our JavaScript code. So this is the function that your JavaScript code, if you were using this, as, as I'm going to show in a couple of minutes, uh, your JavaScript code will call this. You can also see that it's exported using an ECMAScript 6 module export definition. And now I can see you, you know, overjoying out of uh, browser, uh, simple browser compatibility stuff. Uh, it's, not, it's not really simple with WebAssembly. Uh, ES6 modules aren't really implemented for WebAssembly yet, so this doesn't actually work. <laughs> it does work if you use Webpack, though, because Webpack has like their own custom shim. So if you're a Webpack user, good for you. How many of you are Webpack users? Good for you. That's really good. Nice. <laughs> so a lot of people are Webpack users, so this is all you have to do, and then just, uh, yeah. It, it, I'm not going to go into too much Webpack specifics. It's really easy from there on. The, the, like, if you go to the Wasm Bindgen page, it has a set up instructions specifically for Webpack. Um, what I'm going to show you is how you can use, like the rest of you, how can you use this in your app without having to go to uh, Webpack. And then there's this option here for Wasm Bindgen on the left hand side here. It's called no modules, which means we're in a browser environment, so please don't do ES6 modules, but define the, um, the, the hash function in this case, for example, on the, on a, on, a, on an object that lives on the window global, which is how libraries used to work in the, back in the days. Um, so let's do this instead, and I think I'll have to uh, visit a different file and then reload this one, yeah. So now you can see it has an exports definition here, and further down it then puts that exports on the window, and, and so you can basically use it like this. Um, there's another really cool thing, and it's brand new, and it's called another cool flag, it's called Node.js. The Node.js flag turns this whole thing into a, um, into a Node.js definition so that you can just, just use module that exports so you can require the thing. Pretty cool. It runs a node, I think. I, my example is going to be, it does not? I'm, my example is going to be uh, in, uh, in, in the browser, though we can try out if it runs a node afterwards. I'm pretty sure it should. I don't know. Does it? Anyway, once Node gets WebAssembly support, it might. Um, I'm, I'm a browser person. I don't really know about Node, but this is really nice, I thought. Um, let's do no modules then. Um, cool. So now we, we have hasher.js, and we, we have it defined in our root directory, and I showed you what it contains, and now we want to get the stuff that's in there, right? So we want to go into our app.js. And now we have to do a little bit of extra magic again. So we do an import on this global. I, I showed you how we have a global window object now that contains hash. So we're just going to do uh, it was an, uh, equals wasm bind gen, which is how we import our hash function. And then this is uh, a bit annoying still, but people are working on it. We call wasm bind gen on the wasm file that we have, in this case, hasher bg, bg .wasm. And that will asynchronously initiate the whole wasm thing and, and fetch it and, and load it and whatever. So this thing returns a promise. In this case, it works because my button is also asynchronously listening for user input. So this thing's definitely going to finish before my user clicks on Calculate. When you have an app, that does stuff that is supposed to run Wasm before, like, like instantly, synchronously, you need to you know, await this or do a promise and do then run my app or something like this. In this case, I'm just gonna, it's gonna be fine, I hope. Let's do a, yeah, let's finally do some, some demo. 
hash input value. And now we can see, I hope, that, did we have a, oh, why isn't Vengeance not defined? Can anyone guess why? So the, sorry, that was pretty quick. The error is here. The error is wasm bind gen is not defined. Do I have time? I hope so. Um, the problem is that we did not put it in our HTML file. So hash.js is a script that you need to put in your, uh, in your includes or just bundle it somehow and get it on your window global. Now to run, I hope. Nice. So we do have Rust to uh, JavaScript communication now, uh, which is cool, but it's not a hash yet. So now I hope the, the even cooler stuff starts where we just include uh, a Rust module just like that and compile it to WASM2 and run it. So what are we going to use? We're going to use a, I just you know looked this up in advance, of course. We're going to use a crate, a Rust module called SHA2. Um, I, I think it's good, I haven't used it before, but it should be sufficient for our purposes. Um, and I also looked it up, it has a convenience method called SHA2 digest, and we can actually use digest string, which takes a string and just puts out the hash digest of, of that string. And um, yeah, let's just, let's just copy and paste that. All right, so the problem here is we still need to import SHA2. So uh, I'm gonna do this the right way. I'm gonna first add a dependency to SHA2. This is how you do dependency management in Rust. It shouldn't be very surprising to you if you know package.json. It is a very nice change if you have ever done C++ dependency management. Um, and I think the version is 0 0.7, so... And uh, in our library, we need to do the same thing as with uh, XM Crate wasn't Bindgen. We also need to import SHA2. And I think that's it. I think we should be set. Uh, we should be set to use it. Um, let's do cargo build and see what happens. Unknown, unknown. Compiling. Oh, we get an error. Function, okay, this is a, I mean, the error is pretty good, but it's, it's just, hard to read. Um, it says function or associated item not found in SHA2, and it helpfully suggests us uh, an import we should use. So let's just use that import. Let's compile it. See, that's how you use Rust. Like you just get compiler errors until it works. Um, ah, right, so the thing is that you can't like these Curly, like these curly parentheses mean that just output this thing for it, for like it would be a string, like and there's like certain things can like implement this, this kind of interface that string uses. Um, and we actually want to output it as, let's say, hex. And that's how you define it. Yay, it works, nice. It's always the best moment in, in Rust developer's life. Um, and now we have the file and target again. And we're going to do wasm bindgen again and uh, run it on, on our file. And uh, I think like basically this should work without any further modifications on our JS site because you know we just included it. Nice, and there we have the hash. Cool, pretty amazing. So that was it for the demo, I think. Um, we have written some Rust and we have included in our JS. It was pretty easy to use, I hope. Uh, it was a lot of setup, but uh, I, I tried to go through like the very like each step individually. Um, I have a couple more slides. Uh, I think I have a bit more time. So a couple more features of Wasm Bindgen. So we really just scratched the surface in order to get you going with it. Um, it supports like structs, like stateful structures that you can use like JS instances of like objects, and you can put stuff on it, and it retains their state through like even when it's Rust. Uh, you can pass closures back and forth. Uh, it doesn't work in all cases, but in most cases it should work. Uh, you can import JS functions like console.log or whatever into your Rust and then run those in Rust. Uh, it has these opaque JS value types, which is a type that hides the fact, like the, the underlying whatever this is from, from Rust so that it's easier to deal with. 
Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, it supports required from Node.js, although people have not really, uh, I, I don't think people believe me that it's working in Node, so I might be wrong about this. Um, there are a couple things that are still very much work in progress. Um, it is you know, passing around arrays and, and vectors is, is a bit shaky. I think it's being worked on. C, C++ support is in the progress. Source map debugging uh, is currently, it works for some things like mscripten, uh, which I'm not gonna go into here, but uh, it doesn't work for Wasm Bindgen that we have here. Um, and as I mentioned, first class E6 module support. Another thing that I really, really want to mention is, um, so it would be really cool if we could just use the library and upload it to NPM instead of just, you know, making a Rust library in our JS project and then bundling that, uh, that, library, that Rust library inside our own small library and then exposing it to JS, we could just upload it to NPM and then somebody could download it, the, download just the Wasm as an NPM module and that's exactly the idea behind Wasm Pack, which was written by Ashley Williams, or which is still being written by Ashley Williams because this is all very work in progress. Um, you can install it and you can use it to um, Basically, do the same thing that I did with Wasm with Cargo Build and Wasm Bindgen in one step. So, you, if you're in your uh, Rust source file, you can just use Wasm pack, yeah. Uh, oh, Wasm pack init in this case, and it will. You can see it below here. It will um, compile to Wasm, which might take a while. Some I might not show it fully. Um, I think it's doing some additional optimizations, which is why it takes a bit more time. So, and then it will basically generate the same files that I already had in a, in a package folder, which also has a package.json. And so if you just go into that package folder and do npm publish, it's an npm. Boom, and you have uploaded WebAssembly to npm. And then somebody can use your library, your Rust or C++ or whatever library from JavaScript. Um, that's nice, but Still, if you want to use any random Rust or whatever library that doesn't have this published on NPM, you need to do the thing that I just did, where you wrap it with your own kind of library. Right, more Wasm uh, on hacks.mozilla.org. All these things are read out, like written out much more verbose than I just put it uh, on hacks.mozilla.org. It's an amazing series of blog posts by like the people who work on this. Uh, WebAssembly.org, which is an HTTP link, which I just noticed, which is not nice. Um, I, I'm gonna correct that. <laughs> Um, rustwasm.github.io also has like publishes these newsletters this week in WebAssembly, I think. And uh, that's also a really nice read to keep up to date with the rapidly developing world of um, WebAssembly. And with that, I say thank you for listening. <laughs>